No, but this testimony touched me because... And this is something I've been sharing with some folks because I've bumped into a few people that... Do you ever notice how we tend to, tempted to turn the gospel into a method instead of living our life through relationship with Jesus? The church, if we're not careful, will we'll, we'll read our Bible and say, well, if I do this, 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 and this, I can get this, 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 and this. And it can be so impersonal, have nothing to do with relationship or the love of God or the knowledge of God. It can just be, well, I tried that. Well, I did that. Well, I've been quoting that and nothing happened for me. And the people are frustrated. Yeah, hi. <laughs> and, and it's all, you want to live your life from the place of relationship. And here's what the Lord's been showing me, that we're not looking for some great breakthrough even though we all want that in, in, in the sense of, of course we want... But if we live with a, that kind of mentality, you, you're going to have this turn-on switch, turn-off switch thinking. Here's what the Lord was very... And I think we'll all catch this. It's pretty childlike. I, I tend to stay pretty simple, I hope. We grow up into Him in all things. That's Ephesians 4. The reason we teach and preach is for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry so that we grow up into Him in all things, to the fullness of the stature, the full measure of the stature of Christ, the anointing. So we're not, we're not, like, I always say we're not trying to do abracadabra. Jesus' name is not synonymous to abracadabra, pull a rabbit out of a hat. We're growing up into the revelation of His name. We're growing up into the power of His resurrection. We're growing up in faith, from faith to faith, right? Does that make sense? So what I see sometimes people do is they like they rev themselves up in a, in a realm of prayer and then they go out, boom, and then they weigh their results to either be encouraged or discouraged. When we should be encouraged by the faithfulness of God and the truth of His Word. So we are here to grow into Him in all things. So I, I know a minister that I listen to a lot said, listen, he said, these things aren't happening because one day I said, okay, Lord, here I am, let's go, get, let's go for it. He said, I sought the Lord, and I continue to seek the Lord, and He hears my cry. So what he's talking about is a relationship and a process of growing, where you grow up into Him. In. So if you see your Christianity that way, that we're all growing up into Him, you throw away discouragement and stuff. But we all know that because of where the, or, or the, the temptation to draw back, but we all know where the church is and where the world is right now, because where the church has been for generations I mean, a lot of the, what we're teaching has been pretty up for debate right among us in the church and, and, and even crucified in a lot of cases and like, you know, don't even go there, you know, or not even for today, all that stuff. So now watch what happens. So now everything snowballs, sickness is rampant, all kinds of stuff. So now the need right now, while we're preaching this message, the need is so great on the earth. And this is what I see happen to Christians. The more they're hearing what we're preaching, they recognize the need all the more. And then the need starts driving people. And then I see them get discouraged because they they see so much need and they go after some of it and don't see the immediate result. And the need is crying out so loud, they get driven by that. And then they back off and say, oh man, this ain't, or, I'm not, or I must be doing something wrong or it must be something else because they're not getting healed. They didn't get out of the chair. Did it? And, I, and I've seen a handful of people getting like that. Because the need starts driving you and making you, you know what I mean? And the bottom line is we got to wait on the Lord. we got to stay before Him. You cry out the need. You can express your heart to God and say, God, this need is almost overwhelming. There's so much need for the move of God. And then you just start praying about His love and start building up yourself and who He is in you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you keep on moving forward in faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Or you're going to look around and you're going to realize that the need is so much greater than where we are. That's what happens to people. And then they get discouraged. They back off and they grab a lesser belief that doesn't release faith and things just stay the same. And you know, down in our hearts, none of us want to live with that. We, we try to embrace a teaching that kind of says, well, that's the way it's going to be, and there's always going to be da-da-da. But you know that the need's so great and the pain's so great, it doesn't, that doesn't settle with anybody down inside. So I'm just, I'm just throwing out my heart there a little bit. What the Lord's been showing me is that we're growing up into Him in all things. There's no drawing back. We don't look back. Come on, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. We're pressing forward, okay? So in light of saying that, I wanted you to share this testimony because it really connected with that thought about growing up into Him.
<clears throat> the other uh, week or so ago, I I heard this testimony and it just really grabbed me, and I shared it with Dan. And it was this uh, man as uh, as a young man, he had a real success in healing. He raised a man from the dead, and obviously this really filled him up, and he felt just invincible and so the next time he was in front of a congregation I he looked down and in the front row there was a man in a wheelchair and he was so pumped he was having a hard time staying on topic but I mean he was preaching his sermon but as soon as it was it over it was over he comes down off the podium down to the man reaches out his hand and look at him with full faith grabbed him by the hand and said, you know, in the name of Jesus, rise up. And he grabbed and he pulls and the man just comes out of the chair and comes flop right over. And he said, <laughs> the congregation emptied the air of room with everybody's <gasps> shock. And immediately he's down on the floor with the man, wrapping his arms around him, consoling him, helping him, getting him back into the wheelchair and and pray, praying afraid for uh, what he had done to his sermon what was there a law suit coming I mean he was scared but everything went fine and he said he's not a quick learner because it took him three years to understand what happened but three years later I don't remember exactly how, but he was hearing a Smith Wigglesworth teaching, um, and and he so when Smith was ministering, he had this thing where the first person on the stage would get healed. So he came into his auditorium this night. These two little old ladies had a third one standing between them, and this one in the middle was so thin and so frail she looked pregnant because she had a tumor in her abdomen and they're holding her up and Smith stands up there and is <laughs> let her go no we can't we can't you know she can't stand let her go so they let her go boom she hits a floor faith for <gasps> you can hear that run pick her up and they do let her go. No, you, you Swift, you, you saw what happened the last time. I mean, let her go. They let her go. Same thing all over again. Flat on the floor. <clears throat> Pick her up. And he says, let her go again. They scream louder. And at this point, a man stands up halfway back in the auditorium and said, you monster, you quit doing this. Can't you see what's going on? Smith turns around and he looks and points at sir, you mind your business, I'll mind mine, sit down, let her go. They let her go, she starts to fall, gets a foot out, stands up, and there was a thud as the tumor fell off onto the floor. Wow. And the man said, it finally his eyes opened, he said, Smith Wigglesworth and myself had the same amount of faith. Smith Wigglesworth had no unbelief. I was filled. As soon as that man hit the floor, my faith and power evaporated. I had a problem. but And so this to me just so resonated with, with what Dan has been sharing with us that it's there's two two elements here faith and but we've been given the measure of faith we have the faith it's dealing with our experiences as Dan said raising our experience above the word and that, and that is and so I just, that's it it's excellent. And, and then the place you're here in Smith, of course, we're not telling people to just go do, start doing that, stand people up and drop and stand up. Because this guy, when he did that, you know, I read other stories about Smith Wigglesworth. He, he, could, he wouldn't move from that place. It was like 
there was like a militance that built in him. There was like, I mean, I told him one that I heard him do. I, I mean, I, I, you don't, I don't even talk about a lot of that stuff because you don't want people saying, well, they said so and so did that, so we thought we'd try it. Faith isn't something you try, folks. It's something you see and believe. So when you hear a testimony like this, what it's doing is it's separating the two because I know I can relate. I've prayed for a lot of sick folks, and I know there's times that feeling just starts shouting at you, look, we ain't getting it, nothing's happening, it ain't here, da-da-da, and you, you got to fight that thing. And then what Smith was, he grew to a place where he couldn't even see that or hear that. So that's a good part of growing up into all things. So he saw that as adversity or as opposition or like, you know, this isn't the finished result. What you're looking at here isn't the way it is, you know. I do remember why he was talking. I prayed for a lady one time who was 10 years crippled up from an accident, and she was walking very difficult up front to pray for. And it was in a time when I used to pray for all the sick people that came. I, I would pretty much pray for everybody. And... Uh, I asked her what happened, and she told me she was like this for 10 years. She got in an accident, and she was supposed to have gotten killed. And she said, obviously, I'm not dead. And she laughed, and she said, but I've always been like this. And I remember, and I don't know, you know, if it would be right to teach it as a gift of faith. But this confidence, this, I just saw this. I just, I never prayed for her. I said, honey, I want you to turn around and just start going down the hall, or down the aisle here. And I said, and don't let the first step deceive you. That's what I told her. I said, don't let it stumble you and deceive you. She turned. She took one step and looked like she was going to fall on her face. It was worse than any step she had taken. But after the second step, it was better. The third, the fourth, she literally took off. And first time in ten years, she ran the whole way around in a trot. The whole way around the sanctuary. Came up front, laid prostrate, and just cried and cried and cried. And was saying things like, merciful God, thank you, Jesus, all that kind of stuff. She just laid there prostrate crying. Never prayed for her. Just told her to turn and go. But I saw that and said, don't let the first step deceive you or something like that. She took the first step. It looked like she was going to fall. Our minds would have been, oh, my. Right? Mm-hmm. But there's a place where you can see that and grow. But you're, I don't believe we're going to get there unless we continue in a place of filling our heart with this word, praying and fasting and seeking God and saying, look, I, I want to see what you see. God, I want to see what you see. If I see what he sees and I say what he's saying, there's ain't nothing, you know, there's nothing going to stop that, right? It's just, it's just powerful. But you see the difference between the two. So the man saw the dead raised. So that tells you just your zeal isn't the total answer. So he's, he's like, whew, I saw the dead raised. He's got a wheelchair. No problem. He grabs him, but he doesn't get the immediate result he's thinking he's getting. And that's what shook him right there. It wasn't that he didn't believe God could do it, but that shook him, and then he, then he was lost. Then he was never recovered. And then he just consoled the man and got him back in the chair. Where Smith doesn't have room for any of that because of what he sees, and he's like, get her back up. I heard another testimony like that, but I, I, I almost get afraid to preach him sometimes because you don't want people to... This guy was taking care of his little granddaughter. She was on a feeding tube, and the doctor said, don't ever feed her by the mouth because, you, you know, it... it It'll choke her. It'll cause an aspiration. Uh, is that the right word? Aspiration. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Hey>, press <Marshall. laughs> I'm learning a lot praying for the sick. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so he's he, ten months he's praying and believing for her. Make a long story short, she already had been healed of a severed brain stem. They pulled life support, and she breathed and coughed and lived. She was blind. Now she can see. It's just, uh, it's uh, incredible. All the pictures, if you'd look at her, you couldn't even tell she was a little girl. And now she doesn't even have a scar. She's healed normal. It's incredible. But the last thing to be fixed was this feed tube thing. So for ten months, he's speaking the word over her and praying, and he had saw every other miracle. He saw the severed brainstem, blind eyes, the whole nine yards, the whole church watched this miracle, and yet she still so he was troubled with it. And he was and one day he got alone, it was ten months, and he said, Lord, he said he went in the bedroom, he said, Your word says this and this and this and this. And I'm not frustrated with you, but I know I'm missing something. Because ten months you you did this and this and this and this for her, but this feed tube were resting for ten months. And it just wouldn't be like that now if I'm not missing something. I'm missing something. What is it, God? He said, the Lord said, uh, He said, you believe my word against everything you've been told from the beginning of this accident. 
Except when he said the day you feed her is the day she'll choke to death. You took that to heart. She's still on the tube because you believe them instead of me. Now, I, I'm, I'm afraid even telling you all that. Because when I hear that, then you, then you think of things where Christians, you know, they do stuff and their child dies and all this stuff. But what I'm saying is there's a place where this man was in a relationship with God. And he already saw her eyes. He, the, the social worker came to the house and had to report the hospital center there, sending there, because he, he got so frustrated with the hospital, he took her out of the hospital. He wasn't against medical science, but he said there was so much opposition and so much unbelief. And he finally said, look, they want to put screws and pins. And he said, look, you guys, before it's all done, you'll kill her. I'm going to take her home with Jesus. So he dismissed her out of the hospital, which, you know, you can bicker about that all day. But, but, but the social worker came after a few weeks because they said, look, you need to go. This guy is overwhelmed with this situation. She's got to be. You've got to go help. She's sitting there on the couch. The social worker's talking. And he said, well, would you like to meet her? He said, she said, yes, I'd like to go see her. He said, well, she's been sitting here the whole time. The social worker lost it. Because on paper, she's a severed, brainstem, comatose, vegetable child. And she's sitting there communicating, talking, and up and moving and walking. And the social worker lost it. Said, this cannot be the girl on this paper. He said, oh, yeah, this is her. <laughs> Tell him your name, honey. And she's there. So, so he saw all that. So he goes and he gets in the refrigerator and he gets a thing of jello and a thing of juice. And he says, honey, I want to apologize for putting you through this. This is what he told her granddad. I want to apologize for putting you through this for the last ten months. Believe in them instead of the, the word of the Lord that's already done this, 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 and this, and this. Here, just enjoy. Have a good time. You mean I can eat this? Yeah, go for it. He said he gobbled it right down. And he went and got her some more and she gobbled it right down. And then he took her two weeks later for her quarterly checkup and the doctor said I have great news that whatever that flap is that closes the windpipe to these socks what is it <laughs> let me learn That's it right, yeah. epiglottis so. I'm going to get that one down too next time I share this testimony I got aspiration epiglottis <laughs> and uh, he said I got great news for you her epiglottis is working It's wor you can feed her now he said doc I've been feeding her for two weeks and he yelled at him and said, "You fool! What did you? How could you take the risk? You could have killed her." And yeah. that's true. Yeah. So that's why it's scary yeah. sharing these testimonies. I'm like, yeah. But but there's a place where he knew that he knew that he knew. He already saw all this stuff. He's alone. He has a relationship with God. He's not trying to prove faith or find faith or make a point or prove the gospel. He's not on a tangent. He has no twisted motive. He loves his granddaughter. He loves God. And God's speaking to him and saying, look, you didn't, you didn't believe a thing that they told you when they said she'd always be this and always be this. And, and, and Why'd you believe that? And he went, oh, and you can see there'd be a place of conviction there. So the doctor, he said to the doctor, it's funny what he said to the doctor. He said, doctor, in all honesty, the only thing that's made me a fool is for 10 months I suffered this child because I believed you instead of the living God. And he said, as soon as I listen to God, look at the result. Well, the doctor should know by now because she already can see. It doesn't have a separate brain. They pulled life support. He had them all around the room. They were mad at him. The nurse yelled at him vehemently yelled at him and said you make me so mad you know you, you, you got to face the fact that sometimes you keep saying this and this this sometimes God says no and he said can you show me a scripture and verse for that in a situation like this because I can find a scripture and verse that says God always says yes and amen and that would be Second Corinthians chapter 1 and, and uh, so all the doctors were around the table with this young girl and they said now listen you need to understand we're going to pull this plug, and when we do, she's brain dead. So her lungs are going to fill up. She's not going to be able to cough because her brainstem severed, so she's going to die. And he said, oh, no, she won't die. She's going to breathe. She's going to cough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have this whole testimony on tape. It's incredible. I, when I first heard it the first time, I pulled off the road crying terribly and felt like I was backslidden and just full of unbelief. I just cried. I parked right along the road and bald bald didn't even feel like I even understood faith this guy he says to the doctors you're probably all Christians aren't you you all go to church don't you he said every one of them said they went to church and, and confessed to be a Christian he said isn't that amazing you're all Christians but you won't believe this book he said go ahead pull the plug gentlemen that's just what he said pulled the plug she coughed and breathed and they said 
I don't believe it. He said, ain't that something? God does it right in front of you and you still don't believe it. <laughs> but it shows how, you know, we see healings and people go, I don't believe that. You know? And uh, you feel comfortable sitting up here. <laughs> you like it up here, buddy. You can stay here, man. I shouldn't have messed with you. I was thinking, you look good up here. <laughs> Todd and I always feel funny up here. We're like, we don't like sitting up here. Yeah, we'd rather be in group setting or something. But anyhow, it was just funny. Dan, didn't Oral Roberts have a phrase like that? He used to say, I know that I know that I know that you reach that place where you know. You know that you know. know but that's a faith place. Like I've, I've been in a, I was in a situation once. I don't share this testimony much, but the power of what you believe and what it releases, whether it's a positive belief or negative, is incredible. And uh, I was three days old in the Lord, had a surgery scheduled to get a kidney stone removed, and I didn't want it removed because they were going to, hey, buddy, they were going to surgically remove this kidney stone. They were going to go up through my body, grab the kidney stone, and pull it out. And it was a forced thing. It was like they were going to clamp it. It was too big to come through my body. It was blocking the flow in my kidney. It was in the tube, the, the, you know, that goes down into your bladder. It was blocking that. You're a yeah, it was blocking it. John, you're amazing. And uh, that's too much for me, John. I want to preach the gospel. Stop. <laughs> so, so I went in there, but I stopped over at your Christian fellowship, and they surrounded me and prayed for me. I was only three days old in the Lord. I knew my aunt went there, and I had called just to say hi and, and meet the pastor, and we were, I was thinking of attending there because my wife's aunt went there, and I had just got saved on Sunday. And I got pouring my heart out a little, and he said, why don't you come in? The pastor said, why don't you come in and meet me on Wednesday? And I said, I can't. I have a surgery schedule. He said, for what? And I told him, and he said, well, you know, God's moving in a radical way. Why don't you come in? We'll surround you and pray. God can take that. And I thought that was a pretty intense thought. I thought, what? So I went in. I thought, well, yeah. So I went in, and they prayed for me, and I felt this chill thing go up my kidney. It was like when they were praying, it went, and it just like, boop. And I thought, I started bawling. I was undone. I thought, God just dinked that thing. Just took it. And I'm like, woo, and I'm bawling. Hey, Brian, bless you, buddy. And uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm bawling. So I go into the, the doctor's office. They're going to do this surgery that morning. They were going to pump me up with dye. And then they were going to put me on some ultrasound thing and then watch the wire go up and the dye. Something, it was not fun thought and I didn't have to go through it but I was in there and I told the girl I'm like number one testimonial evangelistic guy on the planet right now I'm three days saved I just feel this thing goes and I don't know I don't know hardly anything here right but I'm in there I don't need the surgery look the Lord just healed me and they're like oh okay yeah no serious he healed me I don't need the surgery I don't need the surgery and the nurse is like, well, how do you know that? Well, I went and they surrounded me and prayed. I felt this thing. It was amazing. I had tears in my eyes telling her. I said, I'm telling you, I don't need the surgery. I need you to take another x-ray. Don't pump me with that stuff because I, I don't need the surgery. Now, I never said I didn't have a stone. I just kept saying I don't need the surgery, but it was funny. That, not, that's, that, that just, I thought about that later because here's what happened. She took the surgery. She came in real sarcastic. She didn't like me. And my faith confession, she said, I'm wasting her time. And she just didn't like my zeal. And she thought I was a Christian cuckoo. And I told her I was three days saved. I didn't know too much. And, uh, but I know God touched me. So she took the x-ray and said, well, Mr. Muller, you still have a stone. And she was like gloating, you know. She's holding the x-ray. She's like, yeah, he still has a stone. You're not healed. And I'm like, and, 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 and it, it tried to shake me. But I was so full of zeal and convincing. I said, Honey, that just can't be. I know, I know God touched me. I need to see that x-ray. And she's like, yeah, like, what's that? She so hands me the x-ray or puts it on the, on the board. Well, no, I looked and I had seen my other x-ray because the doctor showed me the procedure and what they were going to do and why. And when I looked at the x-ray, I said, hey, that stone's not in the same place as my other x-ray. She said, no. Well, it's still a stone. It's there. It's too big. And she's like, you're going to need the surgery. No, honey, get my other x-ray. That stone is the whole way in the top. That, the reason he was going through surgery, and I'm, I'm all excited now, she puts the other picture up. She says, well, it definitely is in another location. I said, God did that. Don't you see? I don't need the surgery. I said, don't touch me. I said, you've got to call my doctor. She said, no. She said, you've wasted enough of my time. 
She said, the bottom line is, sir, you still have a stone way too big to pass. It won't break like that when it's that, in the, on its own, not that big. She said, so you're going to need this surgery, and you're in here. We'll be doing this. I said, well, I need you to send them to him right now, because he was right down the hall. So she said, I'll do that, but you sit up there and cooperate because you've wasted enough of my time. And I'm like... <laughs> and I didn't refuse. I'm just sitting there. She puts this tourniquet on me and tightens it, and I'm going, oh, my God, come on. And she's feeling this big 55-gallon plunger with stuff. <laughs> A little exaggeration, Martha. <laughs> And I thought, she's putting all that in me in a moment. And the phone rings. Yahoo! There's a God in heaven. Serious. The phone rings. Yes. Yes, he's right here. Yes, I'm prepping him. What? Okay. Okay. Bye. Oh, my. She said, that's the doctor. We're not doing the surgery today. And I didn't mean to uh, be offensive to her. I said, I've been telling you that all morning. I knew I didn't need it. I was flipping out, right? I had her so mad, and I wasn't trying to make her mad. She was just frustrated because I, like, was believing God touched me. Well, here's what's cool. Don't ever let somebody stumble you or, or, or tone you down. Because when I was leaving the office, somebody, I was just going out the hall, somebody pulled on my shirt. And I looked. Here was the other nurse that was in the room that never said one word the whole time. She has tears in her eyes. She says, I, it's just a privilege to meet you. I've never met anyone with such faith in my whole life. You must have known the Lord for so long, and you must have, you must have been walking with Him for so long to have such confidence and trust in the Lord. And, and she's weeping. I've never seen such a de demonstration of faith. And I said, honey, I was saved three days ago. <laughs> It was so funny. She's like, huh? And I said, yeah, I just got born again Sunday night. I said, but some people prayed. And she said, yeah, I heard the story. And she said, but I saw the, you know, she heard that I was prayed for. She didn't hear that whole story that I just got saved. But she knew that people had prayed for me. But what she was impressed with was my adamant stand. Because I knew that I knew that I knew in my heart something happened, right? So the doctor said in all his work with kidneys he's never seen a kidney stone go up they, he said it's impossible right. he said all the flows down he said never ever does a stone go up he said so th I've never seen this before Dan I said it's God so there I am preaching to the doctor it's God man come on it's God and then I'm like he healed me or he removed it I said why he didn't take it out I don't know but if he did that yay so I left and I believed that God was going to take that out of my body no pain this is what I declared I lifted my hands I said father you did something powerful powerful today. You canceled that surgery and showed me just how you'll move and work in our bodies. I believe you'll take this out of me. No pain, no blood, no surgery. It's just coming out because it's, it's, you love me. I just had this simple revelation. Seven weeks went by. He gave me these pain pills and he looked at me and he said, I want you to keep these with you everywhere you go. <laughs> and I said, huh? He said, they're very strong but they need to be because if that thing moves even a little bit, it'll knock you out like it did the first time and you'll go back to the emergency room and it'll pass you out. He said, so wherever you're at, when you start feeling any pain in your kidney, please make sure you keep these with you and take them immediately. <laughs> and I said, is there any way like if it moves or rolls out of me that it won't hurt? You know, and I was just asking questions because I'm believing it's passing without any pain. And he says, oh no, <laughs> if it moves. Just take these with you, sir. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I leave there, and I'm pretty actually happy-go-lucky. And he told me, I told him, I'm, I, you know, he said about different things. I said, is there anything that, I forget what question I asked, and, and he said, well, uh, exercise. He said, this, I said, well, I jog all the time. I jog, uh, back then I was jogging five to seven miles a day. He said, that's the worst thing you can do, actually. He said, that jar in your body and the jogging thing, he said, this is going to roll that thing right off the ledge. It's going to drop down in there and it's going to wipe you out. And I was like, well, I'm still going to jog. So for seven weeks, I jog, live normal like a man without a stone, right? Now watch this. You know how we use this phrase in the church all the time? Well, brother, you got to use wisdom. Well, I used wisdom that day, but it was man's wisdom. It was logical wisdom. And it was against the grain of what I knew that I knew that I knew. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if you ever heard this story before, but I... I packed the car. We're driving to Montana. So we're going for 19 days, driving 2,200 miles with my wife, a 10-year-old, and a 5-year-old. OK? 
Okay? You want to hear a little side note? John gets on the stories and the stories and the stories. Did you ever hear John tell a story within a story within a story? <laughs> well, <clears throat> here's a little side trail. We drove to Montana, and the children, 10 and 5, never one time said, are we there yet? <laughs> Come on, that's God. That's heaven <laughs> on earth. I'm tired of driving. Are we there yet? Can we? Not one negative complaint word or phrase out of a 10 and a 5 year old tell me heaven wasn't in the car <laughs> worship playing the whole time just <laughs> drove to Montana not one comment from the kids in a negative tone it was amazing so uh, but anyhow we prayed we loaded the car I did like any good daddy and husband would do you go in the house and you look around you make sure you got everything because you're going for 19 days 2200 miles you don't get to wherever and say, oh, we forgot. Let's go back. <laughs> so I went, and I'm scanning the house. I'm looking around. And my eyes, I threw them pills up on the hutch in the living room, or in the dining room. They were sitting back there behind a picture frame. My eyes caught them. Instantly, logical thinking hit me. Reasonable, rational thinking, which there's a way that seems right to a man, right? right. And you could argue all day. You know, whether it was a God thing or not, but, but listen to the story. It's amazing. Because you have to realize, I said in my heart, I'm a brand new baby. I'm, I'm seven, eight weeks in the Lord. I said in my heart, I'm passing this stone. God, I'm, I'm going to live like a man that doesn't even have a stone. That's really what I did. I'm jogging every day. I'm just, I forgot about the stone until I'm going to Montana and I saw the pills. And I said in my mind, watch. 19 days, family trip. See the family out there. 19 days, 2,200 miles, the middle of nowhere. You know, if that thing if that thing would hit me out there, so I, it wouldn't hurt to have them along in case if I would have them. I ought to just have them. You see what I'm thinking? Now I'm totally backtracking 180 degrees from a man without a stone. Now I'm a man with a stone. It's amazing. So I grab the little things and I stick them in the door handle and don't say a word to nobody. I stick them in there. We're driving down the road. I'm having fun. We're worshiping and singing and talking. And, and we're just restored. Our family was in a good place because Daddy was saved. Daddy was a mess, and now he's saved. Man, it was just, it was good. And, uh, whew. <laughs> yeah, it was good. We get to, we're on the turnpike rolling, and the kids, you know, we were asking, you got to go to the potty? And, you know, yeah, we probably ought to go now. We're pushing towards Pittsburgh. We made it a pretty long way without having to stop with the kids. We jumped out and I thought, well, we're stopping. I might as well go to, you know. And I go. I went to the restroom and I'm passing blood in my urine. At the first rest stop after I put those pills in the door handle. I'm jogging every day, five to seven miles a day. Living like a man without a stone. I embrace natural wisdom, human intellect. The church would have encouraged me to take those, honestly. It's just wisdom. Take them along, brother, just in case. But see, here's the deal. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. I'm not condemned for doing that. But I was in a faith thing. In other words, I knew that God took care of me this time and He was going to take care of me. And I embraced an identity as a man without a stone. And then I shifted gears because of circumstances and said, well, you know, it would be wise if I... Da, 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 da. So I'm standing there in the bathroom. You have no idea how this hit me. Because it, I wish I had it on video. It would convict <laughs> people. Because, serious, I'm in the bathroom... And I start bawling and saying this. Oh my God, I've sinned. God, I've sinned. That's, that's what hit me. Now, I know a lot of Christians will put their arm around me. Now, brother, come on. You're not condemned. God loves you. But what I was saying is, I'm not living by faith. I, I believe this instead of you, God. And it felt like a tragedy to me. It wasn't a condemned thing. It wasn't I was going to go hide from God. My heart broke. I was crying in the bathroom, crying. Oh my God, I've sinned. Oh God, and I knew it was those pills. I knew that. I just knew. I go out to the parking lot and I get in the car and I'm crying. And my wife, I just come out of the bathroom and I'm crying in the men's room. And my wife says, Honey, what's wrong? And I said, I've just sinned. And she's thinking, What did you do in the men's room? <laughs> she's, like, she's looking at me like, <laughs> And I'm saying, Oh, I just sinned. You know? She's like, You weren't in there for me. <laughs> And she's looking at me a little nervous. And when I told her my heart, you could tell she just wanted to hug me and like, oh, honey, it's okay. But there was a principle that was getting so real to me. And I had been reading my Bible like 
you have no idea. I mean, I probably, in those seven, eight weeks, read through the New Testament several times already. Just, I couldn't get enough. So I already knew the Word. A couple weeks into my salvation, people would ask me if I was a minister. We were over at the pool one day, and they were like, are you a pastor? I'm like, uh, say three weeks. <laughs> four weeks. But it was funny. But I told her what I did. And she's looking at me like, you know, doesn't seem like too big of a deal. You know, everything could be okay. And I said, yeah, but I said, listen. I, and I explained, and she was like, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. And, I, and she said, well, what are you going to do? Oh, Watch what I said to her. I said, I want you, I just confessed this to you, and I confessed it to her as a fault. James, I just confessed my fault to you. I want you to pray for me that I might be healed. That's the word, right? right. I know a lady got healed of HIV. Well, it was full-blown AIDS on that one principle right there lives right here in York from that one principle right there she was ashamed had AIDS and was ashamed of how she got it so she never told anybody because she didn't want them to know how she got it because she was a church lady a promiscue church lady didn't want that out of the bag so she was dying in shame isn't that amazing God gave me a word of knowledge at a healing service and she lied to me came back two three days later shaking trembling said you're a man of God I said yeah, you can blame me for that. <laughs> she said, you're a man of God. I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> it was funny. I said, why? What? She said, I lied to you. And I said, why'd you lie? She told me. And, it, and immediately, I know it was shame. I said, it's a simple answer. I'm not praying for you. I said, you could tell your best friend what you have and why. And you ask him to pray for you. Next time I saw her, she was 153 pounds. She was 106 on that day. It's phenomenal. So I did that with my wife. She prayed for me. It was probably the cutest prayer. You know, because she's loving me. I'm sitting there crying and she's probably thinking I'm like the saint, you know. <laughs> she's thinking, you didn't sin! <laughs> so she prays like, she probably prayed some works prayer. You know, Dan's such a great guy. You know, you ought to bless him, God. So she probably prayed something. <laughs> Just that sentimental out of her heart. I don't know. But I got out of the car. She said, where are you going? What are you doing? I said, I'm getting rid of these. She said, okay. She didn't say a word. I went and I dropped them right in the rest, right in the rest stop can, down in one of those little <coughs> cone-shaped tops, you know, and dropped down in there. Now, here's the deal. You can preach that, but you can't do that because somebody else did that. That's not why we tell those testimonies, because that's not what faith is. Faith is knowing that you know that you know that you know. Because if I'm doing that because somebody else did that, then I'm, it's not my revelation. It's not my knowing. So it's way off. It's, see, I did that because I realized what I opened the door to versus what I needed to do to close that door. Do you see what I'm saying? So it, it was a revelation to me. So I had no second guesses or thoughts when I did that because here's the deal. So if you're sitting here listening to something like this and you find yourself in that situation and think, I wonder if I should shouldn't take my meds. I wonder if that's a doubt, if that's part of my doubt and unbelief. And I wonder if I should, maybe I shouldn't. And then you put a couple testimonies together and you talk yourself into doing that and you go 10 miles down the road and your kidney starts flaring in pain. You've got to be in a place where you're ready to wage a good war where you're not going to say, oh, what a knucklehead. I shouldn't have did that. Oh, we better turn back. You see what I mean? Because once I did that, I was in, I was back on, I was back in that place as a man without a stone. So I got back from the 19 days and it was a week or two later that thing I passed it in the in the bathroom of our own home. I fished that baby out of the toilet. I did. I fished it right out of the toilet crying. Called my family together and held it up at our light in the dining room and showed it to them. Just crying. I see. I'll call you in a minute. Just crying and told them of the glory of God and, and, and shared the testimony with my family. We got a magnifying glass out. Did you ever look at a kidney stone in a magnifying glass? It looks like the very edge of knife blades trimmed off and all stuck together and glued together. It looked like, did you ever see like stalactites, stalagmites in caverns? Yeah. If you, if you just throw a whole bunch of them in a big ball together and glue them together, that's what this kidney stone looked like. There are calcium deposits built up, but they have edges. They're like crystallized and they have edges. They look like knife blades all glued together. 
And when they just barely roll or touch you inside, like they're so it's so sensitive in there, just cut you to ribbons. It like when, when this oh when this thing first got me the first night it got me, uh, I wasn't saved yet, and my wife and I were a mess, and she had been so hard towards me because I was just not a good guy, and she had no revelation of God's love, and she actually was enjoying that I had this kidney stone. She told me she was just enjoying that I was suffering. She was a good sufferer, and I'm like I was dying. I mean, I remember waking up in the emergency room and they had this catheter hooked to me and this thing that I was emptying into, it was bad. There was that much blood. It was unbelievable. And this guy told me, the doctor told me that I'll bleed if it just moves a little bit. It'll knock me out, almost pass me out, and I'll bleed and bleed and bleed. Because, Well, when you looked in the magnifying glass, here's the deal. This is why I'm telling you this. It didn't break at all. It was big. It was all edgy and sharp, and yet I didn't feel nothing and not one drop of blood, and it came the whole way out of my kidney and out of my body, so it had to pass through the whole urinary tract without any awareness. Now that's just too cool, because the doctor said that's impossible. So here I am throwing these things out because I knew that I knew. I realized what I did. I knew so it wasn't a strategy. It wasn't a method. It wasn't something I was trying to employ to get a result. Well, let's try this. And that's what sometimes I think we turn faith into. And it's not our revelation, per se. It's not, it's not something we see as ours and step out in it. Because faith, we use this term blind faith. I, I don't even like that. Faith is the realization of my hope, the evidence of what I haven't seen. Faith is a knowing. Faith is a reality in your heart. Faith's not a shot in the dark. And let's take the biggest risk we can to see if we move the heart of God. That's not faith. Faith is a knowing down inside. Brian, you had your hand up. All of us. Don't feel like, yeah, don't sell yourself short. He's working with all of us. So. Right. And I'm going to say right, right now I have A lot of contrast thoughts. As far as I mean, yeah, we don't get on topics like should you have health insurance or not, etc. I mean, just your basic, just your dental cleanings and stuff. I guess with what they cost and stuff, go ahead and have coverage if you want to, because that stuff's pretty outrageous. I go get my teeth cleaned every six months, you know, and let them get in there, and <coughs> scrub them up and stuff. I do my own, but and you say, well, Dan, you should believe, etc. I've done it regular. I have no convictions about that. They charge you an arm and a leg to clean your teeth, you know, <laughs> and uh, so. Well, Kimmy has insurance through her work. So we don't... Yeah, we never. I never had a violation with that. But there could be Christians that say, you know, we don't need health insurance or we don't have health insurance. And it's not something to debate over. If that's a knowing in their heart, that would be their privilege. You see what I'm saying? That would be their privilege. That's a Romans 14 thing. In other words, you can cross a line if, if, if you hold others to that because that's what you see. Or vice versa. You see what I mean? And, and we do that a lot of times. Romans 14 says, Some esteem one day different than the rest. Some esteem every day the same. And it says, Don't dispute over this because it's before their God that they stand. Who are you to judge another servant in this matter? It's before God they're standing. He's able to make them stand. And I know how people feel compelled when they believe every day is the same. And they see somebody honoring one day different than the rest. They almost feel compelled to say, man, you need to get free of Jesus. You need to realize every day is the same. You're not under the law anymore, man. You need to back off that. Just go ahead. And, 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 and. But yet the Bible says if they esteem that day unto the Lord, then let them do that unto the Lord. And if you don't, then don't unto the Lord. So it's talking about a pure heart and faith. Not trying to make... Chuck's faith, my faith, or my faith, Chuck's faith. You see what I mean? Because yes. if he yes. sees something, and that means something to him, then there's this, there's, it's a sacred thing. It's a holy thing, and God honors it because it's unto the Lord. It doesn't mean he's bound because he honors one day, and I'm more free because I, hey, loosen up, Chuck, and I every day the same. 
That's what Paul's saying in there. You're stepping out of the law of love if you do that to each other. So topics like that, the health insurance and things, I've seen people do that stuff. Well, if they have faith, they wouldn't even have health insurance. We don't have health insurance. I've heard people say stuff like that. Well, that's fine if you don't. If you see that and that's your choice, that's your privilege before God to make that decision. But don't put that on your brethren. You see? I don't even know how we get on that, but that's just good. Okay? You said before you cannot live on another person's revelation. Yeah, I say that all the time. Yeah. So, and and you got to see what faith really is. Was there another hand or anybody else? Martha? Yeah, I was just going to say, so just listening to your testimony, you said what really impressed me was when you believed that you were a man without a kidney stone, you were a man without a kidney stone. That's exactly. When you believed that you were a man with a kidney stone, you were a man with a kidney stone. It became a threat to me, and it activated in my body immediately. I was bleeding in my urine. Isn't that amazing? The power of what you believe. It shifted that quick and took effect in my body in a short trip down the road, down the turnpike. When I took those pills, what I was saying is, I'm still, a th- I'm, I'm still, this thing's still a threat to me. I'm still at risk. I'm still vulnerable to this diagnosis. And I was taking it when, for seven weeks I lived that thing. I was, I, I don't even know why I didn't get rid of them because I, I did that one time with my leg, and I don't even tell that part of the story. But my wife even said that to me. She said, I think that'll violate you at this point because you know this is demonic. It'll violate you taking them. She said, won't it? She said, you probably shouldn't. My own wife said that. You think it's usually the other way around. A lot of wives are like, now, honey, you probably ought to take them. <laughs> she actually said, I think that'll violate your conscience. You know, if you, if you don't want to take them, I don't think you should. And I said, I was going to talk to you about it because I don't want to take any of them. And I actually got rid of all those. They gave me a bunch of stuff and it turned out fine. But you can't preach that and tell people to do that. You're way wrong. You can't get, try to get somebody to live off of something that's a revelation to you. Now look how subject you can be. This is why we continue in the faith. This is why we continue. Take earnest heed of the things you heard. At least they slip away. Because here I am living as a man without a stone. But then I bumped into the way that seems right to a man. And the logical side of me overrode the faith side of me. And I said, hmm. And the circumstance I was faced with, hmm. And I just had the ability just to go, well, you know, it would probably be wise if I just, because, you know. And, I, and in doing that, I embraced the same diagnosis as before. Does that make sense? Yes. And instantly my body was affected. That's amazing. Yes. When I threw them away and, and, and repented and called it sin, I'll never forget that. I'm in the bed because I said, man, I said, God, I've sinned, you know. And... Uh, the blood instantly stopped, the next rest stopped, nothing, and the whole time, the whole trip, until I passed it at home. No pain, no blood, no nothing. Now that's powerful. Now that's a life experience. That's something that nobody can take out of me. Right. Right. You can debate that all you want. What I'm saying is it becomes a revelation, and you walk through this stuff, and that's how we grow up into Him. So see, there's a place for me to grow where when I'm in the house scanning and my eyes hit that thing, I just keep on looking past and go, you know, don't even consider it because it's done. It's settled in my heart. So there's a place for me to grow where natural reasoning, you got to use wisdom, brother, doesn't have a voice. Okay? Now, if you're doing that to prove something, to reveal spirituality, needing to be right, you're way wrong already. It's, a, it's through relationship and love. It's a knowing. It's a knowing. These things are tough to teach on because the church has a lot of horror stories in her past. There's parents that have withheld, you know, in the, the need to declare the gospel and we're people of faith. They've withheld everything and they've watched their children die. And then it t- throws horror into the church and all kinds of crazy stuff happens because of that. It just does. There's There's got to be a twist there. If somebody's holding out that militant and that diligent seemingly on the outward and then it just takes its toll and causes that much pain, destruction, and uproar, Come on, because the Bible says if it's faith, if the need is is there, that's one thing. But if the heart is pure, the pure in heart shall see God. So there's been a lot of stuff, you know. Motives. I think motives are so important in this stuff. I don't have a, I don't have a need to be seen a certain way. I'm not going to with, withhold from a certain treatment because, see, when I went through that thing with my leg, I had a lot of Christians pull me aside and say, you're in spiritual pride. The way you preach, it's just too hard for you to go get medical help because... It's like going to be a slam to you. It's going to be like a mark to you. And I'm like, that wasn't even in my mind. But people, it was in their minds. 
watch this. If I have the ability to think something about Martha that's not Martha, it just simply means that I have that very potential. I'm yes. thinking that way, that I can be that. It doesn't mean she's that way, but the, the fact that I could think that way and be that way, then I could maybe believe that about her. That's what the church was revealing to me. That the church is actually in an insecure place and they're feeling like, you know, this makes them spiritual, this makes them seem not spiritual, etc. So they were putting that on me. When I was in a time of need, I needed somebody to stand beside me and say, look, I see you're in a demonic war and I understand you know the gospel. I'm standing with you, brother. Praise God. Let's fight and win. Nobody did that. That knew me. They were all telling me the people that were communicating. Were not, that's not to say everybody believed that. But the people that were talking to me, and it was because they cared about me and loved me, they were looking at it getting worse and saying, man, you got to do something. I said, I am. I'm doing something. Well, you need help. I've got help. Well, you're in denial. You're just in spiritual pride, brother. You're just ashamed to go to a doctor because of what you preach, and you feel like that will be a slight to you. And I'm like, that's a new one. That was, I'm in warfare zone here right now. I'm not even thinking, doctor. I'm thinking, Jesus, devil, we win. I'm thinking <laughs> warfare, and they're telling me I'm in spiritual pride, and I'm thinking warfare. I'm not even thinking this stuff. I'm locked in. So it just shows how presumptuous we can be to each other. Be careful not to do that to people. You know, and it footnote that in that situation, that was when your leg was It was twice the size. Face, twice the size was inflamed. It, it was bad. dead. But a demon came into your bedroom and, and I knew that. put that on it. So this thing started out. It was an evil presence came on me attack. and threatened my welfare. And you knew what it was. I knew it was a spirit. So I'm locked in. But because the church didn't have that experience in my bedroom even though they're hearing that, they're, they're still seeing it as a medical thing. And I'm thinking, this is demonic. What do I need an emergency room for? What are they going to do? Pacify a devil? To, to, succumbing? Put me on something so he chills? It's a demonic spirit. And I knew that. So it's like, don't even bother me with that stuff. I will win in the gospel. I'm not against doctors one bit. I'm not. But in that case... In fact, if anybody's ever seen me around doctors, I, I honor them. They're there to help people. They, they've helped lots of people. But, oh, they, you're, you're, a different, you're a different kind of doctor. I'm, I'm even talking just medical stuff. I'm not, I'm not big on medicines. I don't like medicines. Uh, that, that I trouble with, the whole pharmaceutical side. But Because uh, it just seems like a, a cop-out. It just seems like just subdue the symptoms. Now, I say, let's grow in the gospel and then start crushing this stuff, you know. This is why we teach like this. But, yeah, Bob. Tell me this, Pastor. I've been prayed for many times for my eyes right. to be healed. And I believe that I'm healed. So should I drive home tonight? No, nobody's telling you to do that, Bob. Don't even ask me a question like that. That's exactly what I'm saying not to embrace by these testimonies. Nobody's telling you that you should do this or should do that or should do that. No one told me to drive off. No, nobody is. <laughs> but who knows, there's probably testimonies where somebody knows that they knows they get in their heart to do something like that and it seems absolutely crazy and they do it and they're instantly healed. But that you can't pattern that is what we're saying. Right. You can't teach that and say, hey, I did, and you can't write a book the way I received my sight. The next thing you know, you got 25 Christians veering off the road that night, smashing into trees, because they're trying to do what somebody else did apart from the revelation. So that's why it's dangerous to talk like this, because you don't want that mindset or that question to even rise up. So no, Bob, nobody's saying to do that. But there was this lady that came to a service who had tumors all through her sinuses, and she couldn't hardly breathe. And they had to go in there and roto-root them out with a drill thing. And they were going to get all these tumors. It was horrible. June Green. Do you remember June Green? Used to come to YCF. Light-skinned, African-American, just a beautiful lady. Big yeah. smile. You remember her? Watch this. She's at home. Doctor restricted her uh, from driving because of her oxygen intake. And she was getting dizzy spells. And they set up the surgery for two days because they couldn't get her in any sooner, but he said, stay off the road. Now, she didn't hand in her license. He just told her, doctor orders, stay off the road. It wouldn't be wise, da-da-da-da-da. She's at home in the morning, and all of a sudden she thought, 
she said, it's all these growths and obstructions all through her sinus areas. It's just a whole bunch of tumors. And she said, all of a sudden in the morning, it hit her that we had a healing service over at YCF in the morning. And it hit her that she wasn't supposed to drive. And she said, Lord, you're Lord of the universe, creator of all things. You know me and love me. I believe if I can get there and get just get in there in the atmosphere of faith and the believers, I, I, I won't need this surgery, God. You know I trust you. Lord, I am believing you'll get me there, and I'm not afraid to drive it. It's not a foolish thing because you're God Almighty. I'm not doing this in a foolish way. I know if I can get there, I'll be healed. The surgery will be canceled. She said she got in her car, drove the whole way to church, and was totally clear. Said she, she was the clearest she had been. She, she said, she laughed, said, I think I drove better than ever. <laughs> you know? But it's total faith. You can't teach that. You can't tell somebody to do that. That rose up in her heart, and she did it. Now watch. Now, I've never had this experience. I've shared it before. It was the only time it's ever happened to me. I said, you, need, you came for prayer, June. I said, I know you can't. I feel real drawn to you, and I want to pray for you. I need you to stand up. She stood up, and when she stood up, I looked, and her whole face disappeared. This aqua-colored, it looked like a haze covered her whole face. It was just swirling in front of her face, and it was brilliant. It was an aqua color, but it was fluorescent. And I knew in my spirit immediately it was a manifestation, a visual manifestation of the anointing of heaven, the power of God. And it went like smoke. It went right up her nostrils. Well, I didn't know what was going on with her. I just knew she came to the healing service and got drawn to her. So I'm sitting there like I know what's going on or know her situation. I said, the glory of God just goes up into your nostrils and heals you and makes you whole. And she goes, <gasps> and I saw these flashes go, <laughs> like flashing, like it was in her and it was flashing through her skin. And all of a sudden she's standing there, overwhelmed, breathing, crying, saying, I'm healed, I'm healed. <sighs> oh, I'm healed. She's bawling. And I'm like, yeah, I saw this, you know. <laughs> well, it was funny because she made a draw like, and I just got that experience. Well, then a lady stood up who wasn't even going to get asked for prayer, who needed reconstructive knee surgery. She stood up and said, is there anybody else for prayer? Darlene stands up and says, I need prayer. I wasn't going to get prayer, but I'm getting prayer now. <laughs> she could just tell that something happened. I looked down and saw the same thing over her knee. And it went right into her kneecap. I said, the glory of God goes into your kneecap and restores your knee and da, da, da. And she goes, serious, Darlene, right up the hall running back and forth. That's when I told her that Jesus said, go get a bike and ride with me all afternoon. She thought she was to take her new knees in and go evangelize all day and hand out tracks. She said, Lord, I'll go anywhere with these new knees. I'll do anything. And he said, why don't you go get a bike? They're on sale at Walmart. You haven't rode a bike for six years. I'd like to ride with you this afternoon. Wow. She stood on the steps of the porch and cried because Jesus didn't like send her in town and proclaim the gospel. He said, let's go take a ride. <laughs> Who knows at some point she'll go proclaim the gospel. But but anyhow, June went to the doctors and every single tumor was gone. Never had the surgery. She drove, Bob, to church knowing she could, knowing God would get her there. It didn't seem like a foolish thing when she shared it, but when you talk about it, it's scary sound. Because people could get a bright idea apart from faith and love. They could say, well... God honored that in them. He'll honor that in me. And they can almost go on a tangent, get in their car and drive and veer off the road or something. It's, just, it's, just, it's a tough one to talk about. It really is. Some of these testimonies are hard to share because of how people respond. So you have to be careful. No, it's the Lord that inspires these things in our hearts, right? And causes us to do these things. Because, uh, yeah, I've, I've done some stuff. I took my boy one night. I preached on, I preached on unwavering faith in my home group unwavering faith. That night my boy woke up blue in the face, couldn't breathe. Staggered through the house, blue in the face. My seven-year-old son. Now you tell me Satan isn't wicked. I preach on unwavering faith and, and who's he used to try to waver my faith. Now here's what you have to be careful you don't do. You preach that message and you see your son there and all of a sudden you put your son on the line and get in a fight with the devil. Well, you foul devil, I'll prove you. You ain't changing my mind in this message. And all of a sudden, your, your, your motive is just trying to defeat the devil or your motive is just proving your message or something. 
And all of a sudden, it could be at the cost of your son. Let's just get real. So your motive and your heart is so important in this stuff. So you get out of bed and you misread the whole thing and all of a sudden you get in a fight with the devil at the cost of your son and you're just more trying to prove something to him. No, it's always about God loves us. It's always about the love of God. What makes your faith to unwaver is because God loves me. Faith works through... You can't prove it. You can't prove your faith. You can't just get in a war and, and, and take strong enough stand to just validate your faith. It, it flows through love. So I remember my wife. This is a true story. Well, of course they're true. My, my wife, it's just amazing. I just wanted you to know that this is what my wife did. She, she's laying on the bed, and she sat up and went, Oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, because she's a mama. A seven-year-old boy. And he's going, it was so dramatic. He's going, Daddy, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. was that bad. And he's, he doesn't look good. Oh, no. And my wife grabs the phone to call 911. And I looked at her and I said, absolutely not. It's okay, sweetie. This is a lie from hell. Jesus is Lord and he loves us. Don't do it. She says, just what my wife did. She grabbed the pillow, put it over her head, and just started falling. She honored me and believed that I was right. But she was letting me know it was way, too, way over her head. So she buried her head like an ostrich. And cried and praise God for her being real. She's not trying to be super spiritual, wearing some cape, ta da, and being a wreck on the inside. Thank God, she's just being real. She's saying, This is too much for me right now. This is going too far. She buries her head on the pillow and she's bawling. I looked at my son and smiled. I was so at peace. I can't even tell you how much peace I was in. I looked at my son and smiled and I said, Come on, buddy, let's go out of the room just for mommy's sake, okay? She really loves you, too. <laughs> I took him out of the room, shut the door, sat right down on the steps, put him on my lap, and I just said, Father, I'm just so thankful you love us and you gave us a covenant. You cut a covenant through Jesus or something like that. I said, real simple, as soon as I said it, boop, instantly breathe. Instantly. He says, Daddy, I'm fine. I said, yeah, I know. Jesus says, Lord, buddy. I said, listen, this is just an attack, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I went and I tucked him in. Two hours later, he staggered through the house doing the same thing again. Oh. I get up and I go and I embrace him. Cold as ice. No quick thunder. No quick release. It seemed like forever. I'm sitting on my lap and I'm just talking to the Lord and I'm rocking him. And he's sucking for air. And it seemed terrible. And all of a sudden, Daddy, I can breathe. I said, that's good. Just come here. And I just held him. Just rocked him. Who knows? We were in warfare. I'm preaching unwavering faith. Satan's saying, yeah, we'll see how much unwavering faith you have. You'll never preach this message again. This message won't get in the body of Christ because it ain't going to get in you. He was gone for broke. The enemy. He's taking something precious, vulnerable, and dear and trying to get me to misread motive, attack for the wrong reason, and make a lot of mistakes and come up short and then throw away my confidence in the message because of tragedy. Come on, this is serious. Instead, my boy goes and lays in bed, and now I'm like, this is all out war. I mean, I mean, this is war. I laid in bed with my son, put my arm over him, and laid wide awake the rest of the night. Just, just, it felt good. I was later because I knew the Holy Ghost was with me. <laughs> and I got my boy. I mean, it's like the... It felt like he just got him covered under the wing. Yes, yeah, Psalm 91. And I'm just and I'm just looking, and I'm just praying, and I'm talking to God, and I'm thanking Him for covenant. And I'm like, honestly, this might sound arrogant to you. I'm like, if you're going to touch Him, you're going to have to get through me, and I just don't believe you can. I, that's how I felt all night long. That's powerful to me. I was just sitting there because he's seven. I'm his daddy. So I'm right there with him. Daybreak came. He's out cold the whole night. I slid out of bed. He never even knew I got up. I got dressed and went into church praying, worshiping. We had church. It was a Saturday night when this happened, Sunday morning. He came out of Sunday school class. His teacher met him, met me at the door when I went down to pick him up. And she said, you must have had some experience last night. I said, why? Well, he shared a testimony. I asked if anybody had any like, powerful testimony, any good thing to share. And he said, the teacher said, Daniel stood up seven years old and said, uh, the devil tried to kill me last night. And uh, he said, if my daddy didn't know Jesus, I think he would have. 
That's his testimony. I'm standing in the hallway falling apart. <laughs> Devil tried to kill me last night. If my daddy didn't know Jesus, I think he would have. And I'm like, oh, this is all about knowing him. It's just all about knowing Him. It's not about breakthrough. It's not about healing. It's not. It's about knowing Him. But I promise you, when you know Him, there's breakthrough. There's healing. There's. It's all about knowing Him. Yeah. It's not about a prayer method. It's not about pulling out the last three sermons you heard on healing when your boy's doing that. It's about becoming, right? So that was his testimony. But but who knows? That the you got to use wisdom phrase is that's just called 911 because God gave us doctors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But wonder if you're not seeing that way at the time. See, that's why we got to stop fighting over this stuff. You see what I mean? Because I knew it wasn't about that. This was a direct in your face to the message, and it was focusing on my young son. And it wasn't about fighting the devil, it was about receiving God's love because what I preached was true. And faith works through love, so unwavering faith works through love. And there was so I have a lot of those kind of testimonies and stories because there's been a lot of stuff trying to tone me down over the years. There's constantly something trying to tone me down. Thing is, when it tries to tone you down, you get more toned up if you take a stand. <laughs> you just get more convinced. So there's been a lot of personal stuff that's happened. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. So that's just a good example right there. My wife just she couldn't she just put her head under the pillow. Amen. Anybody else? Did anybody have a comment or question? We just kind of started talking tonight and went for it. I hope we're doing okay. John. Good. I think one aspect of this is uh, enduring faith. I think Bill Johnson teaches on it from experience. Um, he lost a secretary and a father to cancer. And that was a few years back. And now they have between 80 and 90% success rate praying against cancers. People fly in from all over the world to come to Bethel. They they have about thirty different ministers. They got a street ministry that I believe is second to none out there. It's just amazing. But they're aggressive. They're going after the gospel of the kingdom and signs and wonders and miracles are following them. They're not chasing them, they're following them because they're believers. And they didn't retreat. They didn't try to figure out why they lost the battle or two important battles but both of those people are with the Lord they're walking on streets of gold right now we don't always understand why we don't win every battle but we've read the book we know we win the war and if we don't turn tail and run we keep going after it we're going to have more and more victories the phrase I'm hearing is don't draw conclusions if you stay on the word and let the word keep teaching and grow up in him don't draw conclusions and define something for the way it seems that's what we tend to do all the time. Does that make sense? And then we won't endure. Go ahead. Yeah. And one other thing, this isn't to backtrack a whole lot, but it's something that we've discussed before, and it actually gets back to the third chapter of Genesis. When Dan was talking about uh, pills and bringing them along, he came into agreement with the adversary. With he the came suggestion. into agreement with the natural knowledge that of man. Yes. And if you go back to the third chapter of Genesis, when Eve listened to the other voice and yeah. came into agreement with it, she empowered Satan, and ultimately her husband followed her, Satan had duplicated himself, and they lost the authority. They lost the keys. Jesus got them back, but we as man lost the authority at that point, and we have to be very careful what we come into agreement with. Right. Ever since, it's what we agree with, we empower. It's just very, this teaching very crucial. Of, of faith is is so critical. Like like what Bob's question, it, it wasn't that it was a off the wall question because it's a, it's actually a very common question when people teach faith. Because I've heard faith taught that well, if you're really in faith, you'll do this, you'll do that, you'll do this, you'll do that. And I just don't agree. I don't teach faith that way. I believe we grow up into Him. We grow up into faith, and then that knowing what was said earlier, that knowing will rise in your heart and you'll actually hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying or you'll get that impression to do something. But I've watched people with good hearts and good intention try to do not not the exact thing that Bob said about going out and getting in his car and just driving, but certain things to defy their situation, to call it faith. 
but it was more a response of a method that was preached to them or something they ought to do if they were in faith, they'd do this. And it was just powerless. And they did it and did it and did it. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it just did it and did it and did it, trying to lay a hold of faith in doing that. And, uh, you know, and you can all, you always, then you hear testimonies of people that say, yeah, but I did that, and God just showed up and moved, etc. But I believe it has to come out of a sense of knowing. Faith is the realization, the substance, the tangibility of your hope. So it's acting on the Word of God that affirms your hope. Who knows everybody hopes to get better? Okay, but the Word of God, here's another good thought. Faith works through love, and God so loved the world, He gave His Son. He gave His Word and made Him manifest. So we have the Word of God manifested even to us now through the life of Jesus because of God's love. So God's love gave us the Word. And faith comes, works through love, but it comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So faith doesn't even come from another person's experience. Faith doesn't come from a miracle. Hope does. Encouragement does. So if I, if I see Nan back there and she has a testimony and I have a similar situation and she's showing this testimony, all of a sudden hope rises in my heart and I say, whoa, man, God did it for her. God could do it for me. And all of a sudden the Word starts connecting and then faith rises through what the Word says. But the fact that God did a miracle, say somebody just got up and got healed, that gives people hope that God does this stuff and moves this way. But the miracle itself doesn't release faith in, the, in another person's heart. Because faith comes by the Word. You have to see it in a personal way. You have to see it for you. Does that make sense? Well, what about the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy? That's, it's, well, what's the spirit of prophecy? So think about that. But, well, the testimony of Jesus, you can... What's that? That's the God reveal. That's the life of... That's not just the acts of Jesus or the doings of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus, that's the end right there. The testimony of Jesus is God revealed, crucified, raised from the dead... That, the testimony of Jesus alone is my healing because righteous judgment comes through his testimony. I'm not talking about the testimony of Jesus, spirit of prophecy, when I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the fact that, say she was in a wheelchair and a paralytic, and all of a sudden we know she's not anymore. That doesn't just instantly release faith into the heart of a person. It, it turns somebody Godward and gets them to embrace a word for themselves in that situation because they see what God did for them. It doesn't just automatically release faith. It's not an automatic place of faith, a miracle. Jesus worked all these miracles among them, and they still did not right. believe him. Right. Right. Capernaum, there was no city that had more things done than Capernaum. And yet they didn't repent. They didn't change the way they thought. They weren't changed. It's amazing. God did more miracles in there. He said if Sodom, if Gomorrah, if Tyre, and Sidon... If, if the things that I did in your town would have been done there, Sodom and Gomorrah would still be here. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, it's just amazing. Uh, but faith comes by hearing. That's what we know scripturally. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. How's the Word come alive in somebody when they see the Word through the love of God? Or it's just a letter. It's just a book. It's just, it's just a method. It's just... I've seen so many people frustrated with faith and frustrated with believing God and frustrated with their prayer life because they're doing it in a mechanical, if I do this, 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 and this, God will do this, 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 and this. And it's impersonal. It's receiving no grace. There's no love, no growing in God. There's just disheartened, mad, well, I tried that and God didn't move for me. I just had somebody tell me that again this week. Well, I did all that. I've done all that. It didn't work for me. Right out of their mouth because they were taught faith that way. If you just say this and say this and keep on confessing this and keep on confessing this, God will move. There's thousands and thousands of people out there that have gone that road. And they feel very come up empty. They have no sense of the love of God and they're actually now mad at the very God they were crying out of and discouraged with, quote, the gospel. I've met thousands of people. Or I've, I've met uh, lots of people which reveals to me there's thousands of people. Because just in my life I've met, i talked to people. They said, well, I tried that. Well, been there. I did that. I, oh, I prayed that. I prayed that for three weeks nonstop every day. Probably ten times a day. God never answered. And I'm thinking, see, here's the difference. He said, well, what are we supposed to do? Take what you're praying and believing in. Turn and look to God personally and just talk to Him and just let Him be a father. 
God, I thank you. You understand what I'm going through right now. And I see the price you paid through your son. I appreciate that you love me. I thank you that every stripe you took, Jesus, on your back is because you saw deliverance for me. You want to set me free. You're such a just judge. You're amazing. That sure beats, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed, by his stripes I'm healed. Get personal. Get intimate. It's a whole lot more than words. It's relationship. It's just relationship. And I understand there's principles of confession and principles there, but if, if they're not coming out through the sense of relationship, if they're coming out mechanically, it's, it's so such a thin line slipping into works. You're not ever healed because of what you did. You're healed because of what He did. And you stepped into a place of believing that. And what you did might have led you to believing that, but it's what you did never healed you. What you did isn't what brought healing. What He did brings healing. Man, get that clear and straight in your heart. I even tell people when they're praying for the sick, it's, it's not about what you pray. It's what you believe when you pray. Right? When you pray, believe. Believing those things that they say, because it's more than words. It's not what you pray that's so important. We put so much focus on what we're doing when we're praying for the sick sometimes that we forget to believe what he's done and put all our emphasis there. That's the emphasis. That Jesus was so aware of that, that's why he didn't pray. He just said, stretch forth your hand. Because he already saw it. Get your bed and walk. Right? So it's nothing he had to produce. It was something that was already there. He just he just gave a declaration or a command or whatever you want to call it. It's powerful. It's authority. So and these are just to me they're simple things, but they lead down a rough road if we don't understand them. I've seen a lot of good people, God fearing people, misunderstanding these things and frustrated. They give up and get tired and they're backslidden. I know a lot of people right now. I I just was sitting the other day saying, God, my heart was breaking. And not in a negative way. It's a compassion thing. There was a whole handful of people that were running through my heart since I've been saved that I know, that I've known that had walked with the Lord that aren't even walking with the Lord. Aren't even pursuing the things of God. Served in the church I was at and stuff like that and came regularly. Not even serving the Lord. It just gets me, man. It's like, Duh. See, because something has to go wrong in here. You, you grab a wrong precept, a wrong mindset. You grab a wrong belief and it disheartens and it discourages and it wearies and it wears on your heart and all of a sudden you have the capacity to just say, whatever, man. Heaven for mercy, I just... No way. <laughs> you know? Just further endurance there. Um, Rollin and Heidi Baker had been missionaries for about 18 years, and in 18 years they developed four fledgling churches. Two were barely surviving and two were mediocre at best. And she was dying of double pneumonia and a blood disorder. And in 1997, she went up to Toronto. She was so ill, she was lying prostrate under the back chairs, worshiping Jesus. She was planning on just taking a retail job if she was healthy enough to do that because she wasn't healthy enough to stay on the mission field. And a lady got a word of knowledge. Heidi Baker was healed by a word of knowledge from the Lord, and she was now healed. She's at the back, and she's thankful. She's worshiping Jesus. Randy Clark's up front. He starts talking about his message. She just gets up in the middle of his message and starts walking down the center aisle. He sees Holy Ghost all over, and he starts prophesying. He doesn't know her from Eve. And he says, the Lord wants to know, do you want the nation of Mozambique? And she falls to her knees. She raises her hands, and she says, yes, Lord. He says, you will see the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead raised. And for the next year, she got the snot kicked out of her, and so did her husband. She got beat up physically, thrown in jail. Her husband was on his deathbed in the hospital. Guess what? 
He's alive and well, has a 200 plus IQ, his heart's bigger than his head, and she's the most loving person I've ever met in my whole life. Well, maybe tied with Dan and Todd. But let me tell Daddy, you, no, she's this is now 10 she's years good. later, not four fledgling churches, but 8,000 churches, almost 100 people bodily raised from the dead in their ministry. And she didn't see one blind eye open her first year. She prayed for everyone she came across. And now she sees bunches of those, but it's virtually every deaf ear on the continent of Africa. They have 100% anointing. She goes out there with these throwaway orphans. She picks up in the dump, literally. And they go out with 8 to 12-year-olds, and they go into Muslim villages. She says, bring me the deaf. Bring me the lame. Bring me the blind. And she always starts with the deaf because they always their ears always open and the entire village is converted it's, uh, that's the power of the gospel of the kingdom but it's through perseverance perseverance you're never going to get there watch what the human mind does in most cases God I couldn't have been you if that was you then why this and how come this and that was six months ago and we still haven't even seen a blind eye and da 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 and the mind is the worst detriment and all of a sudden you got this negative confession and oh, everything you're saying is making sense to your mind but it's at the cost of the call. It's at the cost of the perseverance. It's at the cost of just pressing through and paying whatever price. In other words, God, you said, so I'm going to continue. God, I believe that was you. And God, I just, and you just keep on going. Here's what we do. We draw conclusions back up and make a rational analogy. And it costs us every time we do that. I've seen, I don't know how many people do that over the years. You hear how many testimonies of awesome things God's doing. If you look at the roots of it, it was paying the price, blood, sweat, and tears kind of thing. And, and getting through. David Hogan's the same way. He said in the early 70s, he said he'd go to a village, get one person get saved. He'd go back to encourage him, they'd beat him up. He'd, he'd pray for somebody sick and they'd die. He said they didn't see nothing for a couple of years. He said, here's what he said in this one video. And he said, if I believed like you all believe, I'd have said I miss God and I'd have left the mission field, wouldn't I? Because when stuff's like that, you say, boy, you must be out of the will of God, or not, things wouldn't be going that bad. You find some protection. You find some this. You must have missed God. No, it's adversity. We're in spiritual war. When you declare your city as a cancer free zone and lose your dad and secretary and student after making it's my understanding it was after they made the declaration and went after this. These people died of cancer. That tells you there's a war. When you, when you declare a cancer-free city and start praying and interceding for cancer-free city and you lose your own dad to cancer, a secretary, and a student, that tells you it's a war. Now, that's pretty in-your-face war right there. So then you have to determine what you love. You love your own life and you love the God-given inheritance of your life more than you love fulfilling the will of God or do you love not your own life unto death? Submit them to the glory and presence of the Lord for eternity and know you can't lose in the long run and go after what you decreed because it's a war. And if you go after it, you'll win. Now they're seeing all these people healed. I love stories like that. Because what it tells us is, it's not time to stop and draw conclusions. It's time to press on with the word of the Lord till we see it come to pass. It's a no-nonsense mentality. It's, that's not back off. It's good. Todd's been walking in the gospel of the kingdom for about three and a half years now. Probably four. Well, say yeah. four. And he saw his very first blind eye open in the last week and a half. But it was quite a testimony. It's so funny how that stuff works, too, because we were talking, and I, and I was telling him how, and then it's hunger, and it's perseverance. We were driving in the car from, a, from wherever we were going, or we were heading to Reading that one night, right before he left, and, and he was talking about blind eyes, and I said, I know. I said, I don't understand. I said, I've only ever seen two open uh, in, in my whole Christian life. I prayed for several. I said, I prayed for people with blind eyes, but I've only ever seen two open. And, and I was saying that in a very humble heart cry, like, man, I've seen two. Why not 22? You know what I mean? I've seen two. Why didn't the rest of them open? I was like crying out, like, oh, I need more opening. And when I said I only saw two, Todd very humbly said, well, yeah, dude, that's two more than I ever saw. He said, I, t I take two. And uh, I said, well, amen. I said, but the thing is, we, we know it's right. We're going to keep praying for the blind. I'm just saying, I saw two. You think, you, you know, you have the key, you can teach this stuff, you'd see more, but it didn't necessarily work that way, but I know it's there, I know it's available because I saw two. He said, dude, just lay hands on me because I need to see a blind eye open. He was just holding that conversation. and But he's hungry, he wants that, so when he heard this person's blind, he's not even hesitating to pray. That's pray. He prayed, the second time he prayed, he said, she got her sight. Wow. This is beautiful. Yeah, her whole life. She was 55. From age 13 to 55, she was blind from injury. 
injury from 13 to 55, opened her eye and she could see, count his fingers and everything. That's fun. That's like, come on, God. Let's let the gospel explode in our hearts. Amen? So see, when you, when you taste something like that, as much of this that goes on in the church and all, and you know, we got to be very careful, people. I'll close with this, that we don't get like this in the church. Because there's a lot of that in the church. Don't put your brow up. Well, Because see, you're no good. You're no good with that mentality to somebody now that just prayed for the blind and the eye open. They're just going to, in, their, in a sense, not in an arrogant way, in a sense, feel sorry for you for even having that attitude and saying, come on, why don't you just run with me and let's go after this thing? Why all the yeah buts, well then how comes, and then all the personal hurt, personal agenda, personal grievances, personal questions. we got to get off of that and not let attitude stop us from where we need to go. That's just a strong, straight word. But I see it a lot in the church. It's that, you know... Well, yeah, but I just preached down the other week. I was, there was a fellow in one of our services, and I said, how things go? Well, I said, was it clear for you? And, well, and then he, he had grievances, had issues. And I understand that we have questions, but he had issues. There's a difference between questions and issues. You understand? Right. You can ask a question in humility, and then you can ask a question because in your heart and with attitude you've already answered it in your own wisdom. So it's not really a question, is it? It's more of a bold stated challenge or something. And and the person was mixing up his question with some stuff. Like it was just twisted. And and I he actually got very convicted because the answers it's easy to answer people with the words in your heart. It just is. The word just came out. I could tell he was very convicted and, and, and actually could tell that his what he was saying wasn't really making sense, but yet he struggled finding the place of humility to just say, wow. You could tell he was trying to hold on to a position that wasn't even relevant. And that's just you, that's human nature. That's pride. So that, you know, you bump into that. And you can feel it. You can see it. You can hear it. And it's like, ah, oh, but you keep loving him with the truth because you want that to change. So I'm just saying, every one of us guards your heart from becoming that way. Please. Satan knows how to get people that way. He's done that. He touches you personally. He touches things that touch you personally. You don't see the result you want. And then all these questions rise up. Questions are okay if you ask them in humility. When the questions rise up with hurt attached to them, pain, frustration, attitude, it's very hard to hear an answer. I don't know how well they come when you're in that place, even though God's merciful. So it's just a good... Encouragement to keep your heart in good place. Amen? Amen. Good deal. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? We just kind of rolled and just started talking. Man. <laughs> John has a little CD thing there we were going to play, but a couple things. But we just got talking. Bill shared the testimony, and it just kind of went from there. Any thoughts? Any questions? It's just good. Let's be encouraged. See, if we have a good perspective, we should always be encouraged because we can always grow. We always have the privilege to grow and know Him more. We always have the privilege to grow and know Him more. If you're thinking anything else, you're not listening to the voice and leading of the Holy Spirit. If there's a mindset that's hindering you, stumbling you, holding you back, frustrating you, discouraging you, it cannot be inspired from God. He's all about edification and increase and growing from glory to glory and faith to faith. So we've got to deal with the mindsets that are trying to draw us and pull us back. True? Because every day I'm privileged to walk through this door of more (laughs) <laughs> Yay! and grow up into Him and know Him more than I've known Him before. So enjoy the ride. Enjoy the journey. Don't let the cry of need cause you to scrambling and frustrated. And, 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 and you know, there's, a, there's a big need. You know, who knows the need's great? Amen. The need's great. That should just put sobriety in us to get before the Lord and, and, and stay in the place of prayer and fasting and wait on the Lord. Because if we wait on the Lord, we'll, revelation will flow. We're not being impressed by the need. We're being moved by love. Do you see what I'm saying? Because a lot of people, the need is so great and, and what we're teaching isn't coming fast enough. So they'll, they're trying other things. They'll try other things. Well, let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try that. And they'll go down all the many roads. And ten years go by and you've filled your head with a whole lot more methods and knowledge and you haven't really seen any more folks healed. Heaven forbid we do that. I'm just go stay on the gospel, man. I'm going to follow what Jesus said. We're going to see folks healed all along the way. 
We're not seeing everybody healed, and I'm not seeing enough healed. We're seeing some healed. We're going to see more if we don't back off. Amen? It's the way it is. It's the way it's got to be. Dan just handed me this. I'd ask Dan to come tonight. Ann's back there. Hi, Ann. This is her little great-grandbaby, right? That's the story. Yeah, the little baby that was supposed to be born pretty messed up, right? She wasn't even supposed to be born, but there she is on the picture because Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. The testimony. Amen. I'm not going to go into the whole testimony, but That's it was awesome. we prayed. She was a proxy prayer. So the, the mama wasn't even at the service. No, she was six months. Ago. Anne was at the service. Right. The prophecy came out. We were, we were praying, and I didn't know Anne. And I was just going to pray that, that God would come and unblock this thing. And I was going to command it to be opened and pray like you or I would have prayed that the thing was blocked. It's prayed that it changed. Presently, the prophetic anointing of God came on me. It just welled up, overtook me. God just overtook me. And I started to prophesy. Yeah. I said, yeah. But the Lord, I don't, I don't remember the quote, but it was the gist of it was, Am I not the Lord God Almighty? Am I obligated to unblock this thing? Uh, He said, as a sign and wonder, I'm not unblocking this thing. I'm just going to hold this child in my hands and secure it in my presence. Like I sustained Moses on the mountain, I'll sustain this child three months in the womb and I'll leave the thing blocked. That's exactly what happened. I was overwhelmed. I was crying. I said, do you understand what just happened? I was going to pray my great prayer for this thing to open. And God said, we're doing it another way. (laughs) What's that? Right. Right. But God sustained her just like we prayed, just like was spoken. God sustained that baby for three months, which was medically impossible the way they were saying they said if she wasn't dead, she'd have been like a vegetable kind of situation. She's totally 100% normal, not one complication. I phoned Sarah the day after, and I told her what had happened. And she said, Do you know, Nana, I just feel very powerful. And I'm just not sure what happened. And she said, Do you know, Nana, I just feel very powerful. And I'm just not sure what happened. Amen. God's cool. Isn't that sweet? So there's living proof. That's a good testimony. She came down one night to see you, remember, and tell me, Were you in? I don't think I've ever met him, did I? Did I meet her? I don't, I don't think I met him. I'd remember that. I remember seeing her. No more questions. Is there anything? We're going to wrap up here. And you know, I, I know we call this a, like a healing service, but I see it as much as a, like a school teaching, talking, getting things in our minds clear and straight. You know what I mean? We always want to pray for the sick. Of course we do. But we're the body of Christ. I feel like in these meetings we're talking a lot of times to Christians, the body of Christ, to stir in faith, keeping us moving forward, keeping us active in the release of faith, praying for the sick, believing. You know what I mean? Where God's moving. Yeah, pray and always pray. I have my little shirt on today. Push, pray until something happens, right? I was wearing that earlier. Were you wearing yours too? You gave me that shirt. Amen. You're speaking right to me. I got this leaky heart valve. I'm taking blood pressure medicine. If I take the blood pressure medicine they want, I'd be walking with the cane all the time. It affects my back, my muscles, and everything else. I cut it out today, and I had the best day I had in months. But you made that decision in your own heart to do that. In other words, I'm get a setting a a pattern seemed to be setting up. Right. When I take the blood pressure medicine, I right. blow up with wind, and then I, I feel lousy. Three right. o'clock, four o'clock, I feel wonderful. And this time, I take another pill, and the same old routine. Right. I have nasty dreams sometimes, right. and but this whole experience is what I'm saying, Dave. This whole thing that you're going through led you to the place where you had the confidence today to back that off and, and walk this out. In other words, that came, that rose up in your own heart to do this after. See, I repair lawnmowers. It's cause and effect. If I have dirt in the carburetor, it won't run. 
I know I have to take that dirt out. Now, with my situation, it's almost the same thing. There's something isn't right. Now, when do I completely quit taking pills? When do I take blood pressure? When I, 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 I just don't know what to do. I have an idea what I should do. I should forget the blood pressure machine. But on the other hand, I know what can happen if this thing keeps on. My blood top number, my blood pressure goes sky high and I'll have a stroke. But the bottom number is okay. It's, it's low. Now what do I do? When do I say enough is enough and cut everything out? Do I go to the doctor and let him check me out and give me what he thinks he need, I need? I right, well, that's what we're saying tonight. We never, nobody would ever answer yeah. that question. That's yeah. something you have to know in your heart if you make right. a certain decision. Like nobody could ever tell you what to do in the church. They'd be right. out of order, unless it would be some incredible, sovereign, God manifested thing. But in yeah, a, you need to know in your heart from the Lord what's the right thing to do. And I, in a sense, I would like to have us. a word of knowledge. Somebody give me a word of knowledge you have to listen for that him. I am healed or I should stop the medicine. That's or a place of seeking God, David, praying yeah. and yeah, asking God. him, Lord, I need you to father me in this and give me the confidence of heart to know what I need to do. Because you don't want to get your answer from any suggested right. thing but your revelation from God. So, the, so anything we said tonight, you know, you're saying you're talking to me. In other words, we're we're talking about your situation. You're in a situation like that. It's, but it's all, what you're talking about is identical, right? To the situation. What we're saying different, is different. different. What we're saying tonight is nobody can tell you what to do there. That has to come out of the revelation of your heart. Now, of course, we can surround you, pray, and believe that these complications are overridden by the gospel as far as the outcome, the whole stroke thought. And, but see, when you're saying, on the other hand. I know that if I don't, that number, and there's a stroke, you're actually revealing that you're seeing two sides of this thing. So you're not in the place where we were preaching earlier, like where I did what I did in the parking lot. Because you still see the flip side. There's still a flip side. Do you hear what you had said? Well, see, that's... That's where you need direction from God. That's, that's where this is getting... I understand. It's getting every one of us deal with that. Everybody in this room. 70 <laughs> years of learning gives me trouble. But every one of us deals with that. So this is, this is like Chuck's honey saying, that's a place for you to get alone and hear from the Lord. You pray. You let Him father you. God, oh, 70 years of learning, my mindset, I see a flip side. What are you saying to me right now through the gospel? What are you saying through your love? And you pray and you seek God. That. That's, that's what you got to do. You'll hear. He loves you. When you ask, it shall be given. But a lot of times I think we're trying to get our answer just through certain teaching, encouragement, what somebody else would do. Situations like this, you're never to do what somebody else would do. You do what you know that you know that what you know. What he does is, for me, one of a kind. You know, what he'll do for me is one of a kind. He'll do something a little different to somebody else. Yes. But for me, it's one of a kind. Yes. In other words, Jesus put mud in a guy's eye. Right. But somebody wants to start a mud ministry. <laughs> yeah, right. All of a sudden, you and don't work. a spit tune in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> no, it's not what you do. But here's the deal. Take what you just said and let that be the most intimate, personal thing in your life. In other words, what he does for me is one of a kind. That ought to give you... That persuades you to Him because He sees you that way. You're unique and precious in His sight. He loves Dave. Right? Yeah. You see? So that's how you pursue Him and you'll know in your heart. And you, you know, receive His love. And don't, It sounds like you, you're under a lot of pressure right now. I'd say the first thing is just like that's good let word. go of the pressure. No, if, you it's have, like, if you have four months taking this stinking blood pressure medicine see, that's pressure. and it just, hurts... Just that's so bad that you need a cane to walk. Right. And then all of a sudden, hey, I had enough of this. Right. Now I'm walking all over the place and no problem at all. <laughs> yeah. So in light of that, you get along with God apart from the yep. being pressure driven and you say, Father, this is amazing, this decision. But four months I went through all this. You know how I'm feeling. I thank you right now for your wisdom and direction and I just trust you right now and thank you right now for even the revelation because when you stopped, you had the best day. So it's making you feel like you did the right thing. 
by the result there. So get to God and get answers on the rest of the story, on the rest of what you need to do. Do you see what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where you know in your heart you've heard from the Lord. And where somebody says, well, now, Dave, he's risen by And you say, listen, man, I've been in prayer and God's spoken to my heart. I just know that I know. Well, how do you know, Dave? I just know. It's been, <laughs> it's been some time since I had a word like that. Well, Why, don't, I don't know. But it's Seek just, it. Ask it. Ask. Get along with God. <laughs> talk to Him. Let Him father you, man. Because if we talk about personal relationship in the room, you'd be amazed how... Many of us don't pursue that intimate place as much as we just pray about what we need. And I'm not saying that in a mean way. A lot of us just pray about what we need. We have a prayer list. A shopping list. A prayer list of need. And our <laughs> prayers consist of what we need God to do to make life smoother and better and da 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 da. And not a lot of people, if they be honest, have an intimate exchange with God where they're letting Him father them and receiving His love and and asking to hear his heart. And God, I'm wide open to you right now. And I just love your presence. And I'm asking you to father me today. Right. Not a lot of people do that. They just have a prayer list. And they have needs. Their needs driven in their pursuit to God. Shopping list. Rather than love Great. driven to relationship. Great. And I'm telling you, I, I, when I was pastoring full time, I would ask people all the time what they pray and stuff. Rarely did I have people that said they had could, could honestly tell me they had intimacy and a face-to-face hard time with God in their daily life. It's very rare to find that. But it's not that they didn't pray, but they prayed for the weather to be right for when they go away with the family tonight, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it was all impersonal. It was just prayers to a God out there somewhere, mm-hmm. hoping that he answered their prayer. Mm-hmm. And they conviction told them to pray that and believe in God would move. But rarely did they just... Father, I'm just so thankful you love me. God, I'm so excited that you have my best interest in your heart that you sent your son so I could be your son. Oh my gosh, you're for me. And I'll see. You get flaky in that. You really do. And you just draw close to him in that. You see? So uh, you just be real. There's no textbook on that. That's you being you before God and God being who he is to you. Because you're unique. So to pattern how somebody else prays, like, I, I would sit in counseling and people would say, well, I don't pray like that. i say, no, just be you. You're not supposed to say what I say. Right. Or when you get examples, people say, well, I need to write that down. No, you don't want to go into your prayer chamber or closet or secret place or even in your car and start talking to God and say what I said. It won't mean anything. <laughs> you say what you're saying from your heart. You don't pray what I'm praying because what I'm praying means something to me. It's coming out of my own heart. So if you're just parroting what I'm praying, you're not going to have the same response in your spirit that I'm having, right? right? But we think, well, if I pray what he's praying, I'll have the results. No, it's coming out of the revelation of who we are together. And you want to grow in that, and that's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. It's just you being you and letting him be God. Amen? Does that make sense? Yeah. We'll just close with that. So let's, let's pray for one another tonight and and believe God, there's a couple things. It's a couple people surround Dave. And I know we've done that in situations before where we think, you know, well, we've prayed. No, that's we perseverance. We're continuing. We want you to have wisdom. We want you to know that you know. So ask that somebody that has faith to believe for this, ask that God would give him grace to hear and have ears to hear and know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying right now in his life. Who believes God will do that if we ask? He will, won't he? Mm-hmm. Sure he will. We just did that at Harvest Chapel on Sunday. We prayed for the impartation and the grace to come for ears to hear. That we would hear the Spirit of the Lord like no time in our life. That His voice would rise above and, and we would know that it's God. And it was a grace to pray. He put people at every corner and as they were leaving, we were blessing everybody and anointing them and just praying. And some people you'd hear that their minds would get stilled and, and, and the busyness out of their soul and different things. And it was just cool. Amen. Amen. Anybody else need prayer, want prayer, come for prayer.